Okay. Hopefully we are working. Roger, if you listen to this, and you usually do, we were just having a good discussion about your um, Sunday school lesson. And so uh, I, I didn't put that on here just simply for time. But Romans chapter 8, verse 37 is the scripture that we're going to read for the message this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Romans chapter 8 is a phenomenal chapter. Um, you come out of chapter 7 with the attitude of, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this flesh that I'm in? And then you go into some of the most powerful words I think that has ever been written. One of those lines is we know that all that are called according to the purpose for all things, let me get that right, for all things work together for good to those who are the called according to the purpose. And I probably still messed that up and that's verse 28. But in verse 37, it says this, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God has given us the ability to conquer in the world that we live in. And that leads me to wonder, are you living in a place of being a conqueror in your life? The world has many challenges going on. Are you living in the place of a conqueror? Or are you, and I'm dealing with this right now with people that are kind of in my circle of influence. Things went crazy and war broke out and now we don't know what's happening and our soldiers are being sent over to Poland and into that area and all this is going on and people immediately, especially the young people, oh Mike, what is going to happen? What are we going to do? What will, what will happen in this situation? Are we going to go to war? Is the world coming to an end? And worry and despair and discouragement begins to settle in. I, I want to be careful here in what I say. It, it, has been, it has been a tough world in my world this week. Um, deeply challenged. Deeply challenged. Let's just say it that way. And yesterday, I kind of thought, I'm not going to get up. And I, you, when, when, when Jean was talking about you, Fern, I was like nodding my head because it's like, yeah, I, yesterday I thought I'm just going to lay here. I, I don't. And it was still fairly early in the morning and my phone went off. And it was a anonymous sender. I did not have the name in my mail list. And this is what it said to me. Boone Church needs to be shut down and restarted because it has a really bad reputation. That was actually a phone call? That was the text message. That was the text message sent to me from what at that time was an anonymous Texter, I and I responded since I don't know who you are, I have no respect for your opinion of my church. And um, they responded to let me know who they were. And let's face it, ladies. Um, we've got a really stacked deck against us. Um, the fact that there's just a couple of us here today lets us know that. I hope the people that might possibly watch 
the video today might pay a little bit extra attention. I, I think that the lesson in it, and it just frustrated me, not because of the lesson, but because it kept wanting to stop in the middle of it, and so it never really got into a flow. But I think we need to recognize, and it's interesting to me because the week, and I'm getting way too much into introduction, but because the week was kind of just that kind of a week and my mind just couldn't lock into anything. And as I was sitting there just a couple of days ago in the house, I, I began to think about this old message that I had and just giving you an idea, one of the most wonderful things that happened to me early in my ministry, not because my dad died, that was a terrible thing that happened, but he left me all of his messages. The only problem with my dad is he didn't write very good notes. He was a tremendous Nazarene preacher but he just wrote down words. And so when I got his notes, I looked at that and I thought, okay, dad, that's great words, but what do I do with this? It, it doesn't mean anything because you didn't write any notes in your thinking. Apparently he was sharper in his thinking and so he didn't need to write those notes and I do. I have to have very detailed notes, even though a lot of times I forget them. But this message ended up being the 11 C's to a conquering church. All of the words began with C and he just listed the 11 C's. He didn't put anything with it. But I thought about that and I thought, you know, we're in a place right now that we need to figure out how to be a conquering church. What does it take to be a conquering church? And so I wanted to share at least some of these words with you. And if I've got enough time, I want to get through all of them. The first word is confronted. If you're going down the wrong road and you will not change it, someone or something needs to make you realize that you're going down the wrong road. You need to be confronted. Years ago, I was up in Pioneer, Ohio. And I was serving as a Christian school principal as well as the assistant pastor of the church. And I was asked to go into Michigan to do a service coming up the following week. I was going up to a church that I had never been to. I was going to play and sing for them. And I had no idea what I was doing. And so it was a Sunday afternoon. And I thought, I'm just going to go up into Michigan and find this church. And I did without any problem whatsoever. I came out from the church and I came back to the crossroad and for some reason, God only knows why I did, I turned left instead of right and went north into Michigan. I was seeing the signs, North 199, North 199, sign after sign, North 199. I knew I wasn't supposed to be going north. I knew I was supposed to be going south, but I wasn't paying any attention to the signs. I had my music playing. I was singing and worshiping, having a great time until I came to a sign that said Hillsdale five miles. I thought Hillsdale isn't supposed to be five miles. That's about 40 miles from where I was. What in the world happened? I was going north all that time being confronted by a sign and not paying a bit of attention to it. And I continued to go the wrong way. That happens a lot in churches today. The second thing is conviction. Once you are confronted, then you have to be convicted or convinced that it is the truth what you have been confronted by. So we can listen to a Sunday school lesson and say, oh my, what a good Sunday school lesson. But somewhere we've got to be confronted with the fact that what we heard was the truth. You've got to be convicted of what is said to you. Just because you hear it doesn't mean that you accept it. You must be convicted. Be ye doers, as Roger said, and not hearers only. I promise you that Roger and I don't set this up. 
We don't make plans ahead of time with each other. It just happens that way. Number three is crucified. Your self attitudes and your self ideas and goals must be crucified. As long as that doesn't happen, no church will ever succeed. So this is how this works. If you're trying to follow what your pastor says, what your former pastor says, what your Sunday school teacher says, what you think, what the singer says, what the you, you are going to head into a ditch. Our attitudes need to go by the wayside and what we need in Boone Church of the Nazarene is the ideal of God Almighty. We don't need our ideal. We need what God says. Okay, number four is communication. Lack of communication or miscommunication can destroy the best laid plans. That's a war idea. Disrupt the communication of the people that you are fighting with so they cannot communicate with each other. And then they end up just being scattered people. We saw that in Iraq with people that were in the desert that just walked up and surrendered to our soldiers because they had no communication of what was really going on. And so they were just lost in that. I try to be very careful anymore because I learned that early in my ministry. When news of what we're thinking of doing gets out too quickly, you end up in a situation where people begin to believe things that are not really going on. And so you need to be careful that the communication is really doing what you want it to do. Number five then becomes co cooperation and contribution. They work together. Cooperation must come with each one that are co contributing. We're not lone rangers. We're working together. If I'm a lone ranger trying to accomplish what God wants to do in Boone Church of the Nazarene, it will not work. We need to be cooperating together. So if you're not able to go out, then you become the prayer warrior. And what you are praying is contributing to what the ones that are going out is accomplishing. And so everything in the body, Paul wrote it. We are not all an ear. We are not all a mouth. We are not all a hand. We all work as the body together, but we must cooperate with each other in what we are doing. The statistic tells us, now think about this in a small church. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. In the average church in America, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Boy, that doesn't leave us very much doing the work, does it? So we need that cooperation with each other. I, I really think that people begin to develop an attitude. I don't want to make anyone angry at me, but my job is to preach the truth. I really think that people develop the attitude that it just doesn't matter whether they come to church or not. It, it just really doesn't make any difference. So if they wake up and choose on Sunday morning, I've been too busy, I don't want to go, then they don't realize the damage that that does to the body. The truth is we need our people. And we need them really desperately right now. It does matter. It does make a difference whether you are here or not. Okay. I'm up to number six. Coordination. After people are together, then the plan has to be coordinated. That, that avoids dictatorships. I teach in the leadership classes that you have different leadership styles. You have to watch me. I am a big visionary. And this happens automatically in my attitude. 
I can walk in. I did this whenever they were working on the parsonage over here, the church house. I, I did this. I came in and I walked through the back room because we was going to let the guys in through the back door and leave that open for them. And then they would just lock it and go out when everything was done because they weren't going to get done until the wee hours of the night. And I walked into the back area and my mind engaged immediately. I started thinking, oh, rooms. What could we do with these rooms? What could we accomplish with these rooms? Now, being a visionary is a great thing, but what you need is a different style of leadership, a managerial type of leadership that says, whoa, Mike, we've got four people. <laughs> don't, don't lose your mind. Because my mind doesn't think in the way of, well, maybe that won't work. My mind thinks in the visionary pathway of I look at it and I say, okay, we could do this, 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 and this. That attitude has to come together where you have people that are guiding that vision in the way that it processes. It doesn't mean that God can't accomplish the vision. But I say that when I went to Tucson, Arizona, that was not the last time I was in Arizona. That was I was there before. And we did a vision meeting and I took this great big huge whiteboard. We had a school that rented our facility, a gorgeous facility. It was just and we had like seven elderly ladies that came. But it was just a gorgeous facility. Our sanctuary could probably hold 350 people. And then we had a courtyard where we rented out to the school because we didn't use the courtyard. But we had a great big, they had a great big whiteboard. And so I went in on Vision Sunday and I just wrote out all of these ideas on the whiteboard. These little old ladies blew my mind. We, we started that vision meeting and I began to talk about some of these things and then I asked them the question, which things do you think we should do? They was like, all of them. I was like, no, 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 but, but we can't. I will absolutely end up dead if we try to do all of these things we can't do. We need to pick a few of them. See, it's that attitude of saying, okay, God can do all things, but what is it that he wants Boone Nazarene Church to do? What is it that he wants us to accomplish? Otherwise, you end up in the situation of what we call in leadership things of the tail wagging the dog. You got, you're just flying all over the place with no direction. That's not what you want to happen. You want the dog to be wagging the tail. That's what you're looking for. Okay, I'm getting there. Number seven, commitment and covenant. One of the reasons plans fail is a majority of people do not commit to them. Have you ever brought one person? Have I ever brought one person? People must get committed not only to the cause, but to one another. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you succeed. I want you to do well. I, I want the church to do well. If we don't want that, then why did we choose this church to come to? We've got to be committed to it. And we've got to be committed to the effort. I've always remembered this. I, I got to quit getting off on rabbit trails, but I was pastoring in Portland, Indiana, and we set a goal to have a hundred on that Sunday. Our average church attendance was between 40 and 50. And so it was a huge goal to say, we're going to get a hundred people. People in the congregation went to work and we had 94 on that Sunday morning. I was so proud of them. No, we didn't hit the 100, 
But I was so proud of them. I thought you guys went out and almost doubled our attendance on Sunday morning on this one Sunday by your efforts. The board chairperson came up to me after the service and this was the attitude he said it with. Well, I guess you didn't hit your hunger, did you? And I said to him, if that's all you get out of this, I feel sorry for you. Our church people went out and put in an effort to accomplish something and they did a great job. Did we hit a hundred? No, we didn't hit a hundred, but I couldn't be more proud of them. If you're committed to it and you're committed to one another, then, it, it, you know, don't get down on me for the mistakes I make. I promise you that I make mistakes and I'm going to continue to make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Don't get down on me for those mistakes. Don't get down on each other for those mistakes. We pick each other up because we're committed to one another. Okay. Communion. To be successful conquerors, you must come into communion with God and each other. This is a must. If you want to remember what somebody did to you 10 years ago, you're never going to come into communion. It hurt me what was said yesterday. It hurt me what was said this week. I... I got to admit to you, I, I made a mistake. I was believing something that I thought was there that wasn't there. And it, it ended up being just a slap in the face. And, and I, I tried to regroup from that and I thought I had regrouped from that. And then I got the message yesterday and I thought, wow. But when you're in with communion with God, God doesn't want us holding grudges against each other. And God certainly doesn't want us holding grudges against him. He wants us in communion with him. So that when we wake up in the morning, our spirit engages with his spirit. When we go to bed at night, our spirit is engaging with his spirit. When we're walking in our daily routine, our spirit is engaged. That's why I believe what Paul meant when he said, pray without ceasing. It didn't mean that you was going to be on your face 24 hours a day, seven days a week praying to, but it's that engagement with the Holy Spirit that in everything that you are doing, you're seeking what he wants for you. What does he want for you? I'll wake up in the morning and think, I don't want to go to the restaurant today. I don't feel like going to the restaurant. I'm not even hungry, Lord. I don't, I don't even want to go down there. He says you need to go because there's someone there that you need to talk to. Do I see what he's doing? Do I understand what he's doing? No, I don't understand what he's doing. I'm just trying to do what he says. Do, do you understand what I'm saying in that? Just trying to do what he says. So maybe he will say to you, make a phone call or write a letter or, or, or whatever the case may be. And you think, well, why should I do that? I don't know why you should do that because he says so. That, that's the reason that we should do it. I, it isn't about figuring out everything that he says and does, but it's coming into communion. Once you have come into communion, then the construction begins. You begin to build. If you are faithful, the door will open. There has to come the time when you stop talking and start doing. So what is the building going to be? I, I don't know. I've got a message called Build the Ark. And I had a guy after I preached the message, build the ark, that came up to me and said, so when do we start building? I was like, you totally missed the whole meaning of that. I'm not going to go build an ark. What good is that going to do? But it's the attitude of when God says, then let's get to work. Let's get to work. We can sit here.
we can sit here in our church and say, well, maybe that person is right. Maybe we should just close. Maybe that's what we should do. Or maybe we can step back and say, how can we impact this community? My prayer through these three months of prayer that we've been doing, we're getting ready almost to, to, to go into the third month. My prayer, God, how do I impact this community? John Knox prayed the prayer, give me England lest I die. It's the attitude of there's nowhere else to turn. This is probably the end of my ministry. And I've told people for years, I'm probably going to die in prison. That's probably the truth because I won't stand back and just accept what they are doing. But before I'm in prison, there's work to do. Let's get about the construction. Number 10, contentment. That doesn't mean that you just sat back and say that it doesn't matter. But be ye content in whatever state you are in. I told you before I hate winter. I had to get out yesterday and shovel. I was out this morning and shoveled. I whine at the Lord. I don't like snow. I don't like ice. I don't. But it's learning to be content in wherever God places you. Whatever it is that God has for your life. Be content for that. I'm going to move on for that to the end here. Number 11 is compassion. Love God and love each other. There must constantly be compassion for one another. When we lose this, it's only a step away from the devil bringing division and hurtful attitude. We have to have that compassion. I need to have that compassion for our community. People are watching. People are learning now that I'm the Nazarene pastor. I had it for a little while where I could be whatever I wanted to be because nobody knew who I was. So I could just go in and do whatever and act whatever. I had a lady from Indiana call me the other day about a business issue for me. And I was very upset at them. I was very upset at them for what they were doing. And she started out the conversation addressing me as Pastor Merle. Boy, you talk about somebody taking the fire out of you in a, in a heartbeat. It was like, whew. she knows I'm a pastor. I need to watch what I'm saying. Well, you know what? It shouldn't matter if they know you're a pastor or not. You should be watching what you're saying anyway. Because my witness is very, very important to me. And so when I ruin that witness by doing something or saying something, that is a very, very drastic thing. Do you have a compassion? For Boone, Iowa. If you don't, I'm just being sincere with you. If you don't, if I don't, I think we need to lock those doors and quit. I, I think we need to just forget it. We shouldn't be here serving. I've talked to pastors through the years that did not like their people. And they would say that openly. I do not like those people. I don't like pastoring them. I don't want to be there. And I would think, how in the world can you shepherd people that you don't care about? How can you do that? God help us. We must have the compassion. And if we have those attitudes in us, we become a conquering church. Will we get that today after this message? No. It takes some attitudes of saying, okay, I want to change the direction that I'm going. I want to be a different person for Jesus Christ. I don't want to just be a hearer. I want to be a doer of the word. Father, 
I stood before these wonderful ladies knowing that there has been a struggle in my heart through this entire week. The enemy has been trying to work. And Lord, the wonderful thing is it is bringing me to a place of, of focused decisions. And I pray that you will begin to do that in our church as well as in me. For each of the people that might be watching this video, wherever they are, do the same with them. Bring us to the place that we are focused on what it is that you want to do and not what it is that I want to do. You've given us talents. You've given us oil for our lamps. You, you've given us the ability to go out and to touch people's lives. The, the people that we won't even realize until we stand before you and you say, such as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. The powerful words of Matthew 25 that we heard in our Sunday school lesson today. I pray that we would take that to heart and that we would be molded to the people that you would have us to be. Thank you for being here. Thank you for ministering to us. You said where two or more are gathered together in my name, I will be there also. And I felt your presence today, and I'm grateful for that. Go with us, be with us through this week, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. You're dismissed.